Good morning everyone. I'm continuing my John Maxwell and I'm working through this workbook, Developing the Leader Within You. So I had touched on creating positive change and creating positive change is not easy. It's a long process, but it's something that we all have to do. And it's not, it doesn't mean that we forget about the past because we can't forget about atrocities. We can't forget about murders. We can't forget about break-ins. We can't forget about stress that caused us to lose our health. But we can try to make a positive change and try to build on that and help other people so other people don't suffer as much as what we had to suffer in our lives to make it better for the next generation. So basically this is a workbook, it's a part of the workbooks that we as licensed professionals can order and we can help people facilitate workshops and a lot of people are doing it in the US. They're setting up meetings with companies, they're helping with the executive coaching and some leaders like John Maxwell even go and they do country transformational change so they'll set up meetings with world leaders and John Maxwell has even met with the Pope. He's used these techniques in the Vatican to help to implement positive change. So what I'm doing is part of what this group of people does and it was a friend of mine from high school, Joe Orek, who introduced me to this because she felt that it would help me and she knew I was a spiritual director and it was would be a way for me to combine the business principles and the spiritual principles to take them into my work. So basically in this book, um, there's steps that are listed. It's saying predetermine the change that is needed, lay out your steps, adjust your priorities, notify key people, allow time for acceptance, head into action, expect problems, always point to the successes and review your progress daily. And I think that the important thing is that we always have to keep learning and we have to keep growing. What we did yesterday, the successes we had yesterday are not going to work for today because things are always changing, technology is always changing. So we always have to be adapting. With me, I have a lot of managers who are much younger than me, and I learn from them. The same way that I help family members who are older, the younger people help me. And some of them are very caring. They're very nice to work with, actually, because when I went through a rough time when I first started on one of my campaigns and I was put onto social media, we, were, we worked in pairs. So, the guy that I worked with was very nice. He would message me in the morning and say, are you okay today? Are you feeling okay? Are you working? So, and I did the same for him. So it helps because when there's a very new campaign or there's something very new that you're learning, it can be very stressful, especially if you're older and you've dealt with a lot of change and a lot of stress and a lot of financial instability like me that small thing that you're learning can seem like a big thing to you. Whereas to someone else, it's like, oh, well, that's life. It's just something that you learn. But for me, it was a big change, learning how to work with people on Twitter, how to respond to their queries. I helped them the same way I would help them dealing with the phone or dealing with the email, but it was a different platform. So I had to note my progress and to note what I was doing and how to respond to them and continue from there and we helped each other working in pairs. It made it much easier for us than working on our own and we learned from each other because then we could coordinate our breaks, our lunches and it was a good partnership. So he's left, he moved on, he's joined another company and he's doing well where he is. And I keep in touch with them from time to time. I tell them I'm still looking, I'm still trying to get a better paid job and that I'm much better now compared to where I was. 
So we have to keep doing that. We have to keep noting our progress. We have to keep letting key people know. The same thing with these um, harassment calls that we are getting now, or these fake social media calls, or people contacting relatives to say, oh, this person changed their number, or impersonating me like they did with my mom. There are so many scams today. They have the technology to even mimic the voice through technology. And it's been on CTV, it's been on CBC, they've been reporting it on the news. So before we used to say, oh well, at least with the voice you know, because you know who you're talking to. But now they even mimic the voice. And it can be very, very frightening. So like I've sent a message out to everyone in my network, I've posted on social media, because I'm not going to let somebody think that, oh, my mom is gullible or I'm gullible and frighten us and scare us. When it first happened to me when I was at Rosewell Gardens, when they did it with the taxes, with the CRA, I was very, very frightened. And I had called my friend Bafna in England and I told her they're claiming to be the police and they say they knew my address, they knew where I lived. They knew how much I paid on my last taxes. And she said, Belinda, just be careful because here yeah, they're coming and they dressed up as police officers and they're taking men and women into trafficking. And I had gone, I was working at BMO at the time and I told them and they looked at me like I was loopy, like I was crazy. And they're like, we've never heard of such a thing, people dressing up like the police. I said, I'm telling you that this is what's happening. They, they just looked at me and they're like, let's move on to the next point of the meeting. And then a few days later, there was a piece in the Toronto Sun that came out about that this was actually happening, not just in England, but in Canada as well. So I showed it to them. I said, you see, when I told you people, you just looked at me like I was loopy. I was crazy and you said oh let's move on to the next point of the meeting I said there it's in the Toronto Sun so I'm glad that I was proven right the same way with the police with what they did to me I'm glad that I was proven right because it's scary it's terrifying when you're the one going through it and nobody believes you just like I was falsely accused of being fixated and obsessed with my sister and her family when I have nothing to do with them. They don't even talk to me or keep in touch with me. And then my brother-in-law's friends are saying, maybe it was out of her love for you. I said, what love? If she doesn't even call me or visit me, then what love? And same thing with my brother-in-law. I said, you guys are their friends, I understand, but Please don't tell me that they did these things out of love for me because it's making me seem like I'm a child, like I can't make my own decisions, like I can't travel on my own, like I can't even go to a movie on my own without Eddie Farid knowing where I am or my sister or... I, I used to go to concerts all the time until they started this nonsense. And I'm perfectly capable of looking after myself. If I could live in South Africa, and not have any issues with making my own decisions, then I can certainly do it here in Canada. It's not like we live it, lived a problem-free life in South Africa or Zimbabwe. We, lived, we had all kinds of scams that happened there too. We had people who they were uh, setting up, you could apply for a working holiday to go to England and I went with one of my friends, they had advertised this thing. We went there, they set it up in a posh area, Santon. We went there, when we got there, there was a shell there. There was no office, nothing. They were claiming to be legitimate immigration consultants to help you get the visa to go. And she said to me, did you give them any money or anything? I said, no, I didn't. I just came here to see them, to talk to them. So it's not like we're naive. It's not like we don't know because we come from Africa. We know that these things happen and we pay attention. So I hope BMO considers 
what happened there and that they look at my strengths and they look at the fact that I was the one that brought it to their attention. They were supposed to keep me on a two-year contract. They said, oh yeah, everything's falling into place. When you go home, we'll send the contract. I got home and they let me go with no notice, nothing. So it's very disappointing when the banks do that to you. TD did the same thing to me. And they said, oh, I put the files in the wrong place. I didn't tell the person who came for the interview what to do. Yes, I did. They didn't do it. They had a phone that wasn't working. I told them what to do. They didn't follow my instructions. So they let me go. And I had to fight it. I had to send an email to the recruiter to tell the recruiter what happened, what steps I took, where they could look for the emails. So over and over and over, I'm the one that gets treated unfairly. I'm the one that gets let go from my jobs at BMO, at TD, on the contracts. And other people who do even a less good job than me, they renew their contracts and they keep them. And then they also don't like it because I worked for senior executives. Oh, you came very highly recommended and that intimidates me. You know, in Africa, when people come very highly recommended, people like it because that speaks to your credibility, that speaks to the fact that you can do a good job it speaks to the fact that you have integrity, that you're honest. No, they tell me, oh, it's intimidating. And I'm like, what do I have to do to get a good paying job in banking or in AML or in one of the areas that I'm interested in? Mm -hmm. Instead of taking all the good things about me, they're using it against me. And it's not fair to me. I became like a basket case on those calls that were coming in at teleperformance. Completely like a basket case. I used to shake when they used to start talking to me. And then slowly, slowly with my essential oils, with prayer, with using different techniques, I got myself to a place where I could do the job. And then I remembered, I made a note of which essential oils I used for which ailments, for which emotional things I was going through, I made a note so that next time if that happens, I can go back and I can use those same essential oils in my creams or in my base oils. And I know which essential oils are energetically connected to which emotion. So that helps as well. But I count my blessings. I count the positive steps I've taken. And you can't just say, oh, it's the future that matters. We can't forget about what happened in the past, but we can build on it just the same way they want to rewrite the history books and take out all the holocaust. You can't. You can't take out the apartheid. You can't take out the ghettoization. You can't forget about it and pretend that it was an Aryan race society and that everything was smooth. Because when you do, you have what our government is doing. You have the bringing in of medical assisted suicide. And you have the bringing in of tarnishing reputations, saying, oh, women can't make these decisions, but a child can make them. A child can make the decision to end their life. It's ridiculous what's happening in our society. And there's so many governments being elected that are, they're elitist. And they're racist and people are voting them in in Europe and it's terrifying. So uh, us as visible minorities and even non-visible minorities who believe that we are equal, we are equal in God's eyes, we are the ones who have to fight for it. There was no point in having JFK assassinated and remembered and the killing of him as a Catholic leader. It devastated the world. And I mean it. I mean it. If we don't do it, no one's going to do it. And all these people that are coming against me, I mean it when I say God will punish you and your children. Leave me alone. I'm not joking.
because even before Jesus was crucified, he said, do not weep for me, weep for your children. Because they did it intentionally. I know there's teachings in the Bible saying Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. But they did it intentionally. But when he said they don't know what they're doing, he meant he didn't know the extent of what they were doing and who they were murdering and who they were making an example out of. I take my faith very, very seriously. And I meant it. When I said I wanted to work in banking, when I wanted to work at BMO or one of the other banks, I would still go back, but they must treat me properly. They must treat me and respect me as an educated woman, not treat me like, oh yeah, whatever. No. And I meant it when I told Officer Summers and the Toronto police, if you want to go to court, we can go to court. Because I did nothing wrong. And I told the truth. And just because other people don't want to tell the truth, don't tarnish it and don't put it on my reputation. Because it's not fair to me. I worked so hard to make my father proud of me from the time I was a little girl. People can say, oh, you're too good. Good. Well, instead of putting me down, why don't you try to raise your standards and why don't you try to be as good as me? Because it's not easy, right? It's too hard for you to do it. People didn't lose their lives for nothing. The JFKs and RFKs and Martin Luther King, they didn't lose their lives for nothing. You watch all those movies, how when the black women got arrested, visible uh, minority women, they did to me on those calls what they did to those black women. Don't fight back. No aggression. I want you to tell them, fuck you. Don't you dare fucking tell me no aggression. You think you can abuse me and shout at me and give me fucking grief and then you want to tell me no aggression. Go to hell. It's not right what's happening in our world today. And I'm glad people are starting to follow me on YouTube, on Facebook, and watching my videos. Because it's scary what's happening in our world today. It's scary what's happening in Europe. And right here in Toronto, it's scary. Visible minorities can't get the same treatments you can't get the dental treatment. You can't get good paying jobs. You've got better education than other people like me. I've got better education and more skills and I still can't get a position in banking, in the fa financial institutions or engineering or consulting. And it's not like I'm asking for those senior jobs. I do apply for those, but I'm applying for entry level jobs for administrative assistant roles and I still can't get them. And it's not right. And if, if people set this up, what's happening to me deliberately, I hope they get caught because I don't deserve it. 21 years of my life in Canada going through this, one thing after the other, it's not right. I also want to come out of debt I also want to have that support to study, to ed be educated. I didn't get it. I still have good working years ahead of me. Now I set up that GoFundMe. There's millions of people doing it, not just me. And I'm praying that I will be able to get out of debt. I'm not going to stop helping other people, of course not. But I also want things to work out for me. I want things to change for me. And if other people are getting frightened, good. Because if it happened to me, it can happen to anybody. And when you're hurting me, you're not just hurting me, you're hurting Goodmans, you're hurting the South African community that I represent, you're hurting the U of T community that I represent, you're hurting Rothman that I represent, you're hurting the church. You're not just hurting me. And at a deeper spiritual level, you're insulting God who created me. 
So think about what you're doing before you go ahead and do it. Because those of us who help to create positive change and help to make things better are not going to stop. Because we are not going to let evil win. We are going to win.